journey through the epic adventure that is the story of Nehemiah. We've made it to the final chapter. And the sermon I preached on this section I called Remember Me. This really is a fascinating end to the book of Nehemiah. And it's also a fascinating end to the end of uh, Old Testament uh, narrative. Because this really is the last of the narrative books of the Old Testament. If you have a look at the book of Esther which comes after Nehemiah in most of our Bibles. The events of the book of Esther probably took place between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We hear some words from a few prophets, but this is the end of the story from a historical narrative point of view. And after all we've seen, in many ways, it is a a sad, a bleak, a frustrating, disappointing end to the book and it it causes us to think there's got to be more so i really do encourage you take some time to read through the chapter a few times there's some very important repetition that you'll see jump out a number of times in this section and spend some time praying asking god to help you to understand his word because we do need his help by his spirit this is his living word to us and as always i'm just going to highlight some of what I've seen in this passage. The reason I called my sermon from this section Remember Me is because of this repetition that we see at the end of each of the key sections within this uh, big narrative where Nehemiah himself cries out to God. It's a cry of desperation, Remember Me, Lord. We're looking at the structure of this section. Uh, You've got verse 1 to 3 sets the stage for us and then you've got three big sections, so uh, 4 to 14, 15 to 22, and then 23 to the end of the chapter. Just an important note on the timeline of when this happened. So we're told here in verse 6 that Nehemiah wasn't in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, he had returned to the king. Now, the 32nd year of Artaxerxes is the year 433. Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem in the year 445 BC. So 12 years had passed since chapter 1, Nehemiah had left. And he promised the king in chapter 2 that he would return. And it was 12 years later that Nehemiah returned uh, to King Artaxerxes, uh, most likely to continue as his cupbearer. So since the dedication that we saw in chapter 12 of Nehemiah, uh, that great climactic moment with the people walking on top of the walls, dedicating themselves to God, wanting to be a people who live for his glory, about 12 years or, or probably a few more, probably more like 15 years have passed. And sadly, all the promises that we saw them make in chapter 10, we see them systematically undoing. So... Uh, Chapter 10 is very important context from a a Nehemiah perspective. And chapter 1 is also important context because in chapter 1, Nehemiah said, my people are in a great trouble and disgrace. He went home, did reforms, things looked a whole lot better. But sadly, by the time we get to chapter 13, the people are still in great trouble and disgrace. So all that Nehemiah worked for is systematically undone in chapter 13. And that's why this call, Remember Me, is very much a cry of desperation. Because when he says here, remember them, he's saying, Lord, remember them because they haven't lived your way. But he's saying, remember me because I tried my best. I did everything I could to try and get your people to live your way in your world for your glory. But by the end of the book, we see that sadly, he hadn't done enough. Now, as I said, verse one to three sets the context for us. And we're told here about Ammonites and Moabites. And what we'll see through each of the sections is that foreigners, people who were of foreign descent, had caused trouble among God's people. Now, for details about the Ammonites and Moabites, 
you can go and see in uh, Deuteronomy 23 why they were seen as such firm enemies of God's people. And it's important uh, history to go and follow up on. And they were actually told, God's people were told, that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be allowed within this, the assembly of God's house. So what they repeat here comes from Deuteronomy 23. And also in Deuteronomy 23, Balaam is mentioned. Now, if you want to go and pick up some history about Balaam, then you can read Numbers. And particularly uh, 22 to 25 is the biggest story of Balaam. But the important chapter for us is actually chapter 31 of Numbers, where we are told that Balaam was the guy who taught the foreign woman how to entice God's people. And lead them astray. And what we're going to see throughout this section is foreigners playing key roles. Uh, we see in the, the first section, Tobiah is a foreigner. Tobiah we met throughout the book as an enemy of God's people. He was an Ammonite official and he's given a room in the temple which is catastrophic. In the second section we're told about people from Tyre, also foreigners who were coming and these merchants and sellers are also people from outside of Jerusalem, foreigners coming in and causing God's people to go astray. And then in the last section, we see that men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, Ammonites, Moabites again. Um, and we see that these uh, foreigners were leading God's people astray. And we'll dig into each of those a little bit more. We see that Nehemiah ends by telling them, get rid of, purify yourselves of everything foreign. But sadly, the, the book, the Old Testament, this chapter ends with this cry of desperation, Lord, remember me. I've tried, I've done all that I could, but all that Nehemiah could do, sadly, wasn't enough. Now, chapter 10 ends with the word saying, we will not neglect the house of our God. But here, in the first episode, in chapter 13, Nehemiah says, Why is the house of God neglected? And so this first episode is God's people undoing the promises that they had made. So we see this repetition of the house of God in this section. And the specific thing that we see is that this guy, Elisha, the priest, who was put in charge of the storerooms, had given one of these large rooms to Tobiah. And when Nehemiah hears that Tobiah had been given a room within the house of God, he takes all of Tobiah's household goods and he throws them out of that room and he gives orders to purify uh, the room. And we just see you know, these reforms that Nehemiah had worked so hard to ensure happened, we see them systematically undone. And in each of the episodes we see he rebukes them. Um, he calls. He, he shows them their sin, and he calls them to change. We'll see it again. I rebuked them, and then in the final episode, I rebuked them. So that repetition. Nehemiah comes in. He sees the problem. He shows their unfaithfulness, and he calls for them to change. But what we do see throughout this section, Nehemiah had come home uh, to Jerusalem, but. The moment he steps out of Jerusalem, so while he wasn't in Jerusalem, um, things went bad. So when he came back to Jerusalem, there was a foreigner, an enemy of God's people, Tobiah the Ammonite, living in the temple. Um, we see in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, there are people bringing um, goods and selling goods in Jerusalem, the city that he had worked so hard to rebuild. Um, is being systematically destroyed by the unfaithful people of God. The specific sin that is in focus in the second section is that they had promised to keep the Sabbath, but throughout the section uh, we see the Sabbath is repeated, so that's what's in focus here, and they haven't kept the Sabbath holy. Uh, again, foreigners, people from Tyre and other merchants and sellers have come in on the Sabbath and they are selling uh, food and produce and God's people are um, not keeping the promise that they had made in chapter 10 and they are buying 
uh, food and goods on the Sabbath. And then the last section also refers to what we saw in chapter 10, where God's people in chapter 10, verse 30, they had promised not to uh, marry foreign women. So this is uh, from chapter 10, verse 30. Uh, the previous section here, uh, they are, are disobeying uh, the promise that they made in 10, verse 31. And then this whole section uh, from 4 onwards is what they made from 10, verse 32 to the end of chapter 10. And here they had promised in 10, verse 30 that they wouldn't marry foreign women. Uh, but here we see that they had married them. They had given their daughters in marriage to them. So we see the key thing is marriage to foreign women is what is in focus here. So systematically, they had undone the promises they made. They had promised to not neglect the house of God, and yet the house of God was neglected. There was a foreigner living in the house of God. Because the foreigner was in the house of God, the place where the Levites were would have put the large room uh, where they kept the tithes it wasn't there, so they couldn't get the provisions they needed to do the work, so they'd gone back to their fields. Everything that Nehemiah had worked so hard to achieve was being systematically undone. Again, he, he puts um, responsible people, he puts trustworthy people in position again, but he must have been so disheartened and he prays in desperation, remember me, Lord, uh, for what I've done for the house of God. It's kind of, he's saying, I've kept the house of God holy, even if no one else has. And then the next section, the Sabbath, again, there's people coming in, selling on the Sabbath, and he puts people in place again. Some of his own men, we're told. So he's trying to put steps in place, more trustworthy men. But by the end, he prays, remember me. And again, it's like saying, I have kept the Sabbath holy, even if no one else did. So Lord, please have mercy on me. And then at the end of this section with marrying foreign women, he again puts steps in place. He purifies the priests. He tries to uh, get everything right so that the people can carry on living God's way. But he pr prays in desperation, remember me with favor, my God. Um, again, he's saying, Lord, I've tried. Uh, I've done everything uh, that I could to try and get these people to live your way. And yet they are disobeying. Uh, they aren't living your way. They're marrying foreign women. And the big problem with marrying the foreign woman, uh, he highlights King Solomon, the wisest king Israel ever had. Even he was led astray because of a foreign woman. He was led into sin. And Nehemiah is kind of saying, look, if, if Solomon was led astray, don't trust yourselves too much. You're all in a real danger of being led astray by these foreign women. Another repetition that's just worth seeing in this section is he speaks about our God a number of times, our God. But then he also speaks about my God. And in each of his prayers we see this. It gets very personal. My God. My God. So although he's addressing this nationwide corporate sin, each of these prayers end on a personal note where he's saying, remember me with favor, my God. Saying, I've tried so hard. Nehemiah really gave his best, but sadly, by the end of this book, we see that his best wasn't good enough. Now, as we think theologically about this book and we see these words, remember me, uh, those words actually pop up at a number of places in in the Bible. So remember me, it's said in uh, Judges 16 by Samson, just before he defeats the Philistines with the last act of his life, he prays, Lord, remember me in 1 Samuel chapter 1 by Hannah, as she is praying in desperation for the Lord to answer her prayer, to give her a son who she will give back to the Lord. She prays, remember me. In Job chapter six, uh, 14, um, out of the depths of despair, uh, Job prays, Lord, remember me. And we see it's also in Psalm 106, 
um, uses words of a confession of Israel's ongoing unfaithfulness, and it's contrasted with God's ongoing commitment to his people. And then in verse 4, those words are used in the confession, remember me. And then they're used here a number of times by Nehemiah saying, Lord, remember me. And with all of those, they're showing that these are actually cries of desperation. It's not Nehemiah in any way saying with pride in his heart, Lord, remember me. It's not that. It's a cry of desperation. I've done all I can. Your people are sinning. They're sinning. They're sinning. Lord, please remember me. I've done my best. Now, very beautifully, as we see, this is the end of the Old Testament. Old Testament history ends here um, on a terrible note in many ways. But thankfully, God's word doesn't end here because in the New Testament, uh, we hear these words, remember me again. And they are heard on the lips of a very surprising person. These words echo off the lips of a criminal on a cross being executed next to Jesus. In Luke 23, verse 42, one of the criminals next to Jesus cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me. To which Jesus responds, Today you will be with me in paradise. So this cry of desperation at the end of the Old Testament actually becomes a cry of great hope in the New Testament. As we see uh, this man cry out, remember me, Jesus, that becomes a cry of hope for all of us. We can cry out, remember me, knowing that God will remember, that he will save us, that he will give us his spirit, who will help us to be a people who worship God properly, who rest in God properly, who are set apart for God properly. He will empower us to actually do that. And so as you teach this to others, help them to see that, yes, the Old Testament ends in despair, but it's not the end of the story. There is very, very good news coming in the New Testament. And so as we hear the thief on the cross saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom, we can know that that is a prayer we can cry. And so we can be a part of that kingdom because of the work that Jesus was finishing when he was dying on that cross next to that criminal. And so actually, this cry of despair ends on a note of great hope. And as you teach this to others, make sure that you end by showing what a great hope we have, all because of King Jesus. Well, God bless as you dig in further.